so what we are uh, uh, supposed to worry about is uh, you know see we are worried about uh, uh, compactness of uh, families of meromorphic functions okay so uh, so basically you are trying to do topology on a collection of meromorphic functions and th see this is the technical background uh, that is required to prove the uh, picard theorems and many other theorems in fact because the the route is through uh, so called montel's theorem okay so you know what i want to do is i want you i want to go back to some topology and tell you uh, about compactness okay so that you realize uh, uh, how uh, whatever we are going to do is connected with all this we'll have to bring into the discussion uh, arzela ascoli theorem and, and then montel's theorem okay and then we'll uh, 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 you see uh, uh, so I'd, so let me say the following thing you know what we have done so far is the following we have defined a spherical derivative all right so first of all uh, so let me sum up uh, what we have done so far we we have first we have uh, tried to think of a meromorphic function as a continuous function even at a pole okay that's because we allowed the value infinity and so we are not only look at looking at complex valued functions we are looking at functions with values in the extended complex plane so you allow the value infinity the advantage of allowing the value infinity is that a meromorphic function at a pole can be given the value infinity and it becomes a continuous map it becomes a continuous map when you consider it as a map into the extended complex plane which is identified with the riemann sphere okay you know it's a complete compact metric space right now so first we had to deal with the point at infinity okay so we try to think of infinity as a uh, isolated singularity when is infinity an essential singularity when is infinity a removable singularity when is infinity a pole okay all these things we discussed behavior at infinity okay and then value of the function at infinity that also we have uh, 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 we worried about okay uh, so you allow uh, in principle you allow functions uh, uh, not only to take the value infinity but you also want to study functions at infinity okay so the you see these are two different concepts in the in the in the in, in the in the co domain of the function usually we are interested only with complex functions but now you allow the value infinity the advantage is that you can make a meromorphic function in a continuous map even at a pole okay then not only that in the domain normally the domain of the function is usually a domain in the complex plane but then you also want to study the function at infinity itself so you want to put infinity also in the domain okay so you have to define you have to understand the behavior of the function at infinity okay so a function may have a pole at infinity it may go to infinity at infinity which is the case for example if you take polynomials non constant polynomials they all have poles at infinity so you want to be able to work in this kind of generality that is the reason why we have to study the function behavior at infinity think of infinity as a isolated singular isolated singularity and classify that kind of singularity and we also want infinity to be a value taken by the function for example the value of a meromorphic function at a pole okay so we had to deal with infinity that was the first thing then the second thing is uh, is uh, we were worried about uh, 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 this defining the spherical derivative okay we were concerned about uh, defining the spherical derivative and see the uh, the important thing about the spherical derivative is that uh, the spherical derivative will not change you can first of all you can define it for a meromorphic function okay so uh, it's a derivative uh, that will work even at a pole so if you take a meromorphic function by which by definition is a function which is which has only pole singularities okay of course it may be completely holomorphic it may be completely analytic but we are interested in uh, in the situations we are going to really encounter are those in which there are actually poles okay so uh, if you look at meromorphic functions honest meromorphic functions you take a pole at the pole it's not differentiable because after all you know at the pole uh, the function goes to infinity 
and it's it's not differentiable because it's a singular point. It's it's not it's not a removable singularity. It's a it's a pole. The function is not differentiable in the usual sense of the term. Okay, and the function value is also not defined in the usual sense of the term. But what we do is we define the function value at the pole to be infinity. That's an extra definition we make. And then since you cannot dif you cannot differentiate the function at, at a pole. So what you do is you do this clever trick of differentiating uh, uh, not with respect to the usual metric which is the Euclidean metric but you try to differentiate with respect to the spherical metric. So you introduce what is called the spherical derivative okay. So that gives you a, a derivative of a function which will work even at a pole you see that is the advantage. If I take a meromorphic function at a pole I cannot differentiate it but if I take the spherical derivative the spherical derivative will exist and I have told you that the spherical derivative we, we calculated it last time I think it was uh, two, 2 divided by uh, the modulus of the residue at the uh, simple pole if it is a simple pole and it is 0 if it is, uh, if it is not a simple pole if it is a pole of higher order. So even the spherical derivative makes sense and on top of all this. Uh, one more beautiful thing about the spherical derivative is that the spherical derivative will not change if you change the function by its reciprocal. That is if you take a, fun a meromorphic function f and calculate the spherical derivative you will get the same thing if you took 1 by f okay mind you which is also meromorphic with only the, with the only thing uh, is that the poles and zeros will get interchanged when you move from f to 1 by f but for 1 by f also if you calculate the spherical derivative you will again get the same thing as the spherical derivative of f. So what it tells you is that if you are studying the spherical derivative you can f actually apply the theory of analytic functions and stop worrying about even poles because at a pole of f I can simply uh, if I am working with the spherical derivative in the neighborhood of a pole of f it is the same as a spherical derivative uh, in a neighborhood of, of that point for 1 by f but for 1 by f that point is a 0 okay. And therefore it is, a, it is analytic 1 by f becomes analytic uh, at that point that is the advantage. So working with a spherical derivative allows you to reduce to analytic functions okay you do not have to even worry about poles that is an advantage and the other thing is it gives you a derivative that works even at poles okay. Now so this is the this is this is what we have done so far now why did we do all this we did do we, the, the idea is there are two concepts on the one hand we are worried about compactness of a family of meromorphic functions that is our main aim we want to do topology on a collection of meromorphic functions on a space of meromorphic functions we want to what kind of topology of course topology means there are many things right there is uh, connectedness comp, uh, connectedness compactness and so on and so forth but we are interested in compactness okay and so that is on that is on the one end on the other end uh, what we have is this uh, spherical derivative that is that is what we have uh, which, which is which is close to a derivative uh, in the case of a uh, in the case of a meromorphic function okay. So now I need to I need to tell you people how uh, I need to tell you people how to connect these two things okay. So we need to do some topology. So I will give you some topological background so uh, topological background. So this is very very important because only then you will understand what is going on okay uh, uh, in, the, in the broad sense what are we trying to do okay. So if you want to get an idea of that this is very very important. So, uh, so what we will do is we start with let us say let us say uh, uh, you are working with a metric space suppose you are working with a metric space okay mind you the the topology I am worried about the topological property that I am worried about is compactness okay. So we will try to uh, do uh, try to understand everything connected with compactness right. So start with a metric space which is the simplest kind of topological space that you can think of which naturally occurs okay. Then what do you have uh, uh, the following are equivalent. is uh, compactness 
number 2 is sequential compactness and number 3 is the so called Bolzen away stress property. So, uh, so, so we have these three, uh, these three properties are equivalent. Okay. So, I am, I am just trying to recall what is uh, equivalent to compactness. Okay. Just if uh, it helps to translate a property in different ways to find out equivalent properties so that you can work with them. Okay. So, uh, compactness is a, uh, so, so uh, this, is, this is something that you should have done in a first course in topology. What is compactness? Compactness is that every open cover admits a finite subcover. Okay, that is when you are, are given a collection of open sets whose union is the full space, then it is enough to pick only finitely many among those collections, uh, among, among in that collection whose union is also the whole space. You can extract a finite subcover from every open cover. That is compactness. Okay, it's a very, uh, it's you see, it's defined only in terms of open sets, and it's a very general thing. So. It's, it works for any topological space. Compactness can be defined for any topological space because for any topological space, open sets make sense. Okay, uh, defining the the collect the a collection of open sets is exactly the the uh, given what uh, giving a topology is. Okay, so compactness makes sense for any uh, topological space. But it's a very abstract notion. At least for metric spaces where the topology is induced by a metric. Okay, that means that you know uh, your open sets are. Uh, uh, defined to be unions of open balls and open balls are, uh, they, are uh, they are the analog of open balls in uh, Euclidean space. You take points of the space and then you take all points which whose distance from the given fixed point is less than some positive number which you call the radius of the open ball. Okay. And of course, you say strictly less than because if you put less than or equal to then you will also include the boundary and it will not remain an open set, it will become a closed set. Okay. So, you put strictly less than the distance should be strictly less than some positive radius. Okay. And if a set is called open, if it is a union of such open balls and this is how you uh, and you know this uh, involves a notion of distance that is where the metric in this space is used. So, the metric space, uh, the metric induces a topology. So, when we say metric space and you think of it as a topological space, you always mean the topology induced by the metric. Uh, the open sets are precisely those which are given by union of open balls and open balls are defined by the metric, all right. No. Now, for such a metric space, compactness which is a very abstract thing is connected with what is, is, is equivalent to sequential compactness. So, what is sequential compactness? It has to do with sequences. What it says is that you give me any sequence of points in the space, I can always find a convergent subsequence. That is what sequential compactness is. If you give me a sequence in the space, the sequence itself may not converge, but at the worst, you can pick out a subsequence which converges. Okay, that is sequential compactness, and that's equivalent to compactness. That's what this this basic result says. And then there is a third property which is called the Bolzano stress property. What is this Bolzano stress property? It's 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 uh, it's just a property which is uh, satisfied by the Euclidean spaces, which you uh, namely. Uh, which you would have come across namely the fact that you take any infinite subset that it has uh, an accumulation point or a limit point. Okay. Given any uh, infinite subset, uh, all there is a cluster point, there is a point where uh, there is a point of the space such that uh, uh, if you take uh, any open neighborhood of the point and delete that point, there is a point of your infinite subset there. Okay. So, points of your infinite subset come closer and closer and closer to at least one point of the space and that point is the limit point of that set. Okay. Now, that every infinite subset has a limit point is the Bolzano away stress property and that is also e equivalent, this a space having this property uh, uh, is also uh, is also compact. Okay. So, all these three are three different avatars of compactness, okay. all right. sequential compactness and then Bolzano away stress property. Okay. And uh, well, if you are looking at Euclidean spaces, okay, that is R n, uh, n dimensional real spaces, finite dimensional real spaces, 
then uh, what happens is that this is also equivalent to uh, if you look at a subset of Euclidean space compactness is equivalent to closeness and boundedness put together okay and that is what we most of the time uh, when you are working in Rn uh, n dimensional real space we keep using that all the time when you whenever you want to say something is compact you say it is you just verify that it is closed and bounded. For example, if you take a closed disk in the complex plane that is uh, closed disk in the complex plane is compact because uh, it is it is uh, disk of finite radius so it is bounded and it is closed so it is both closed and bounded so it is compact. So we keep using this all the time okay. So let me write that down for, for <coughs> uh, 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 Euclidean spaces. r to the n uh, we also uh, we also have uh, equivalence of the above with 4 the, so this is uh, uh, for in fact I should say for subsets of for subsets of Euclidean spaces. So, the subset should be uh, closed and boundedness ok. So, if, if something is closed and bounded is compact and conversely ok. So, um, mind you you know um, uh, uh, you know uh, my bag the, what is the background of our trying to understand all this the background of our trying to understand all this is you want to do this for functions for a space of functions you want to do this for a space of functions for a space of functions if you take a space of functions uh, it will be a subset of uh, all functions of the given type. So, for example, if you take a space of continuous functions real valued functions it will be a subset of the space of all continuous uh, if you want continuous bounded real valued functions. Okay. and or you might be looking at a space of analytic functions or you might be looking at a space of uh, meromorphic functions that is the uh, that is the background in which you uh, that is the generality in which you want to do all this and you want to make sense of compactness for such a set of functions. So, usually we use various terms sometimes we say family of functions if you want to specify an index set or sometimes we say sequence of functions. Uh, if you want to think of a sequence of function um, uh, elements which are each of which is a function or you take a subset of the space of all functions okay. So, you refer to it in different ways but then basically you are looking at a subset of functions and you want to study compactness for that okay. Now, <coughs> now you see uh, the, 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 the question is of course uh, that uh, you know uh, how do you uh, how do you go from this to something else? So, there is a very important uh, uh, there is a very very important property and that is called <coughs> uh, total boundedness ok. There is something called total boundedness ok. Now, what is this total boundedness? It is a very very strong form of boundedness it is a very very strong form of boundedness. So, what is this total boundedness? So, I will try to explain to you. So, basically what happens is that you know you have some space x ok and let us assume that uh, x is a, uh, x is a say metric space suppose x is a metric space uh, there is something uh, so the, the idea of total boundedness is like is to you know uh, fill out the whole space by finitely many disks open disks of a fixed radius ok no matter how small that radius may be that is the idea so, total boundedness so here is my space x it is a metric space ok and then for every epsilon positive no matter how, how small it is there exists a subset a epsilon uh, subset of x a sub epsilon and this is uh, the point is it is a finite set. So, it is only a finite collection of points a epsilon uh, finite ok 
such that you see uh, the union if you take if you take the union of all the uh, 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 if I take the union of all the open balls centered at points uh, <coughs> xi of a epsilon and take radius epsilon and I do this for i equal to i uh, 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 so you know in fact let me not put a subscript let me get rid of the subscript and just put <coughs> x belongs to a epsilon. So when I say x, x belongs to a epsilon there are only finitely many such x because a epsilon is finite and for each such x I so you know uh, so here is a here is one x here and then I have this this ball centered at x this is open ball centered at x and uh, radius epsilon okay and I do this for all the points of a epsilon I take the open ball centered at each of the points of a epsilon with radius epsilon okay and if I take the unit th that should be equal to x that is the that is the requirement. So uh, I can cover x by finitely many such uh, open balls and the beautiful thing is that uh, the all these balls have the same uh, uh, radius epsilon okay and there are only finitely many of them they cover all of x okay and this must happen for every positive epsilon this should happen for every epsilon greater than 0. If it happens for a particular epsilon uh, such a collection of points uh, finitely many points a epsilon is called an epsilon net okay. So this is called an epsilon net so this is called an epsilon net and this is the net condition <coughs> okay. Now uh, this is uh, this uh, <coughs> this uh, see you are saying that uh, no matter how small an epsilon you take. I can make sure I can find I can make sure to find only finitely many points in x such that every other point of x is at a distance less than epsilon from at least one of these points that is what you are saying right. So let me repeat it what is this epsilon net condition given an epsilon no matter how small okay you are able to find finitely many points that they will const constitute the elements of the set A epsilon such that given any point of x its distance from at least one of these points is less than epsilon that way you cover every point of x okay it is a very very strong condition it is an uh, uh, and you know the point is that this is this is this is a very strong form of boundedness because this implies boundedness because you see why why does this imply boundedness if you see you know uh, so uh, 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 so so let me say it in words. So, the, so, so let me put this here this implies uh, uh, or rather let me write it above uh, so let me put it here this implies boundedness and why is that true see in fact what it will tell you is that uh, um, you know it will tell you that the diameter of x is comparable to the diameter of any of these a epsilons that is what it will tell you. See what is the diameter of a of a space if it is a metric space the diameter is the supremum of the lengths between two of its points and you allow those two points to just vary. So it is like trying to draw the longest line segment through that space if you want to think of it and measure the length of that. Of course this longest may not exist so uh, it may become infinite so your, your space may have infinite diameter so that is the reason. Uh, we instead of taking maximum we take supremum so basically what you do is you take supremum of the distances between two points of your space and you allow the points to vary okay if that has a finite value that is called the diameter of your space and the point is if your space is totally bounded then its diameter can be compared to any epsilon net so for example you know if you take an epsilon net such as a epsilon okay and you measure the distance between two points of the space what you can do is that each of these points is within an epsilon from one of the points in the net and the distance between two points in the net cannot exceed the diameter of a epsilon mind you a epsilon is only a finite set so it has a finite diameter a finite subset always has a finite diameter because you are just going to take supremum of 
the finitely many distances between pairs of points in that set and that is only finitely many pairs. Okay. So, uh, the diameter of any finite subset is of course finite all right and uh, 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 and you know if you uh, look at the diameter of A epsilon okay, that will be an upper bound for the distance between any two points of A epsilon. Okay. Now, if you take any two points of the space for each point I can find a point of A epsilon which is to within an epsilon. So, what this comparison will tell you by triangle inequality is that the diameter of the space cannot exceed the diameter of A epsilon plus 2 times epsilon if you write it out alright if you use a triangle inequality. The diameter of the space cannot exceed the diameter of A epsilon plus 2 epsilon for every epsilon greater than 0 that will tell you that the space has finite diameter okay. So, you can see it is a very 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 strong condition. Yeah. And of, of course, if the diameter is finite, it means the space is bounded. If the diameter of a space is finite, that means uh, if the diameter of the space is say uh, lambda, positive number lambda, then the space is of course bounded because you take any point in that space and take a disk of uh, 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 take an open ball of radius greater than lambda, the whole space will be contained in that. So, it becomes bounded. So, totally bounded is very strong, it implies boundedness, all right. And in fact, actually for Euclidean spaces, you see boundedness is the same uh, uh, as total boundedness. Okay. And in fact, more, more generally if you take a Banach space, if you take a, a complete normed linear space, if you take a Banach space, even for a Banach space, you see the fact that every subset that is bounded is also totally bounded is a very strong condition. It will happen if and only if the Banach space is finite dimensional it cannot happen in infinite dimensional Banach space. Okay. So, if you go to infinite dimensional spaces okay, which is like non-Euclidean kind of spaces then you are in trouble. Okay. Uh, there is a difference between total boundedness and boundedness, okay. but total boundedness a priori is a very very strong condition. Right. So, for example, you know if you take R infinity, infinite uh, sequences of uh, you know uh, infinite sequences of real numbers. then what will happen is that uh, if you take the unit ball there that is of course uh, you know bounded but it's not totally bounded because if you take the diagonal sequence which consists of uh, zero everywhere except one in the ith place for i equal to 1 2 3 4 it's called the diagonal sequence okay then that sequence will never have a convergent subsequence because distance between any two points of that sequence is a finite quantity so, it is a finite positive quantity, it is a constant okay. and uh, therefore, uh, you cannot have a convergent subsequence because if there is a convergent subsequence then distance between points should come closer and closer, but this does not happen. All distance between any two points in that sub in that sequence is, uh, is, is equal to some fixed positive quantity. Okay. So, if you take r infinity, the unit ball is uh, bounded, but this is certainly not uh, totally bounded okay and what i am trying to say here is uh, basically a theorem in fact what i am trying to say is that you know if you have compactness which i have written on the left side in its various avatars in its various avatars i have written compactness sequential compactness see all these things uh, they all imply total boundedness okay compactness or sequential compactness or Bolzano Weierstrass property, they all imply total boundedness. Of course, what I wrote below is that you know they, they all imply uh, 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 for Euclidean spaces, they all imply closeness and boundedness, okay. But it is not just a compactness in, uh, in general gives you a very strong thing, it gives you total boundedness. Now, the question is how do you come back from total boundedness, how do you come back to compactness? Okay. And the answer to that is a theorem, uh, you, if you want to come back this side, what you will need to do is you will have to put the condition that your space is complete. Okay. So, with completeness, so let me, so let me, let me try to use a different color so that you understand the, implica the implication that is involved. Uh, with completeness, so if I go like this plus completeness. If I take a metric space that is totally bounded and I add completeness to it, 
okay. Completeness is the condition that every Cauchy sequence converges, okay. That is, you put this completeness condition, then you will get compactness, okay. This is a, uh, so you know in, so what I am trying to tell you is, see we are trying to move from compactness which is a very abstract thing to something that is related to boundedness, okay. And why we are doing this is because when you are studying functions or spaces of functions, it is easier to verify something is bounded. If you want to say a function is bounded, that is easy to verify, okay. Whereas if I want to say that a collection of functions is, uh, uh, is compact, it is it's, it's very, very abstract, okay. So boundedness is something that for functions is easy to verify under, uh, under many situations. So that is why we are trying to move from compactness to boundedness and the, this is the root. Compactness implies uh, uh, boundedness for example in Euclidean space, okay. And in fact it is equivalent to closeness and boundedness. But if you forget Euclidean spaces, compactness gives you total boundedness, which is a very strong form of boundedness. But from total boundedness if you want to come back to get compactness, you need completeness. So the translation so far is we have we have so basic topology teaches us that you can translate from compactness to completeness plus total boundedness okay now what i need to do is that i'll have to now translate all this to functions spaces of functions okay and that's where uh, uh, what we'll uh, uh, come across is the so called arzela haskell theorem and then uh, there, so what we will do is there we will try to uh, see uh, how to decide a certain collection of uh, functions is compact, okay. So you will, you can expect that, you know, you will say uh, the condition that will be needed is total boundedness and completeness, but completeness you will get if the collection is already a closed subset because a closed subset of a complete space is complete. So if you are working for example with the Banach space of uh, uh, real valued functions or complex valued bounded continuous functions, okay then uh, any subset, uh, any closed subs that uh, any closed subset will automatically be complete. So the only thing that is required for it to be compact by what I just said is that it should be totally bounded, okay. But then from total boundedness you want to even remove the totalness and come down to a, a boundedness. That is where you have to bring in the Arzela-Ascoli theorem, okay. So I will explain that in the next lecture.